Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Hughes and I'll be your host today for a webinar that presents Joe Selvick and Duncan Lauder of Fixture Fab. This webinar is presented by Advanced Assembly and Royal Circuit Solutions. If you have any questions or need technical assistance, please email mhughes at aapcb.com. This webinar is being recorded and slides will be available within the next uh, two or three business days and they will be found at aapcb.com forward slash blog. Our previous webinars are available at either aapcb.com forward slash blog or royalcircuits.com forward slash blog. So if you'd like to check out some of our past webinars, visit us there. We put the slide decks on when we are able to. As we go through and you have questions, please ask, ask them in the Q&A uh, function down at the bottom of your screen. With that, let's bring in our two uh, presenters today, Joe Selvick and Duncan Lauder. Joe and Duncan, nice to meet you guys. How's everything going today? It's going great, Mark. Thanks for having us. Yeah, oh, well. no, the pleasure is all mine. Um, before we get going, can you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves? Maybe Duncan, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, so my name's Duncan Lauder, and I'm the founder of Fixture Fab. Um, I've been a electrical or a test engineer for the past 10 years or so um, at various consumer electronics companies, and I've always uh, been super stoked on <laughs> circuit board testing. So that's why we started Circuit Fab or Fixture Fab. Oh, cool. And uh, do you have any projects that you're particularly proud of in your uh, resume there? Um, so, uh, I guess like the biggest things that I've done is I brought like kind of implemented um, PCBA testing for a couple of different uh, companies that uh, ended up manufacturing like five to 10 million products, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just being able to stand up a test line and like actually see it go into like full mass production was uh, really, really fun. Wow. What? Yeah, that's that certainly better than my most recent accomplishment, which is eating a tube of Ritz crackers. Um, <laughs> wow. And Joe, how about you? Tell us a little, little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I went to the University of Minnesota for computer engineering, uh, I think seven years ago now. And then I've been mostly a software engineer ever since then for like various companies doing software quality. And then Duncan and I have always bonded over wanting to build our own company. And there was a nice fit um, with his fixture idea. So, so recently I've been handling a lot of the sales marketing growth for Fixture Fab 2 while we build our initial customer base. All right. Do you have any, uh, any hobbies outside of engineering that you enjoy? Uh, I played competitive chess for 12 years through grade school. So that was really fun. You're kidding. Yeah. Competitive chess. That's, I mean, I don't even... I have trouble with checkers. Uh, I mean, really, I, I should be out there just, you know, hitting rocks with hammers is my level of skill with that. But man, good for you. That's certainly, uh, certainly a challenge. All right. Well, with that, gentlemen, I'm here to learn about, uh, about test fixtures. Teach me everything there is to know. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so today we'll kind of go over like a PCBA functional test fixtures and kind of like what they are and um, how you can build them. And then uh, we'll also uh, do a, go through a demo of like how you can design a fixture using our automated design platform towards the uh, end of the presentation. Um, and this is kind of aimed towards any uh, electrical or firmware engineer or basically any development engineer who's working on a hardware project and interested in um, implementing a test during the uh, manufacturing process. So, um, the typical PCB manufacturing process uh, is kind of broken up into three different states. There's the assembly state where you're um, placing the components on the circuit board and then soldering them onto it. Then that's followed by an inspection state where you'll actually use a, like a automated optical inspection and possibly automated x-ray inspection um, to verify that components are in the correct location. And to do this, the, uh, those machines actually use computer vision and uh, a reference to a golden board to make sure that everything's in the right spot. Um, after inspecting that all of the components are in the right spot, you want to electrically verify that all of the um, 
you know, component values and solder joints are uh, connected. So for this, you can use both in-circuit testing and functional testing. And in circuit testing, uh, you can use either a flying probe machine where it has two needles that will actually go around and touch test um, points on the circuit board and take measurements between them. Or you can use an in circuit test fixture where it will actually be a bed of nails and um, it will go into a fixture and perform the same uh, type of testing. And then functional testing is when you actually apply power to the circuit board that you're testing and then you functionally validate that everything works on it. So you'll um, validate that like a motor driver works or that your voltage rails are correct. So we'll be focusing on functional testing today. So what does a functional test actually do? For this, we're just using a SparkFun breadboard as an example. So this is a Arduino clone with like a couple different components on it. Um, if we were to try and test this during manufacturing, we'd wanna test that um, the voltage regulators on the board are outputting the correct voltage. Um, that the processor can actually be programmed and run, um, and then that we can actually communicate with the processor over USB since there's a USB to serial chip on it. And so whenever you implement a functional test, you're just looking at verifying that uh, all of the functions of the circuit board actually work um, and uh, that you can then integrate it into the full product that you're building and everything will run correctly. Um, a big thing to know with functional tests is that you're looking to just validate that it works. You're not looking to verify anything. So you don't really care about your test limits to, you know, plus minus point something percent. Um, you're fine if, you know, you make measurements within a couple percent. So it's just kind of go, no go testing? Yep, exactly. You're looking to just validate that it actually does what you want. And if there's any critical features that those um, are there. So the SparkFun breadboard, would they have actually gone in with flying probes and, and done that here? Or do you think they just kind of plugged it in? Um, on this one, I think they uh, mostly just plugged it in. They definitely have some sort of test fixture, but uh, there's just not very many test points on the circuit board. So it's not really aimed towards uh, being tested by flying probe or a, like a bed of nails fixture. All right. Yeah. Um, and actually, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see this board a little bit later on and we can um, explain the test points on the bottom of it. Um, so the main reason for why you want to implement a functional test is to help you save time um, and money when it comes to scrapping uh, bad circuit boards. So if you test the circuit board at the uh, board level, then if it's um, failed, you can either rework the failed component or scrap the circuit board and all you're out is a circuit board. Um, if you wait until later in the process, like uh, in this example, it's like the circuit board that goes into the iPhone. Like if that circuit board is assembled within the entire phone, when you get to the uh, end of line tests and it fails, you then have to completely disassemble the phone, which I don't know if you've taken apart a cell phone, but it's just a ton of adhesive. It's hard, it takes a long time, and it's really expensive. So by implementing functional tests, you can identify these failures earlier and save you time and money by at the end of the manufacturing process. What's the, you know, you said you did a, a thing with five or, or, or 10 million. Mm -hmm. What's the yield on, on that sort of thing? How many errors or what percent errors do you tend to see? Yeah, so um, your error rate will like decrease over time or at least that's the goal. So like uh, when we initially introduced the product, we were actually failing like pretty high. So we're uh, about 30% of the boards would fail functional tests. And this was a combination of um, kind of fixture issues where there's like false failures from the test fixture, as well as uh, the um, PCB manufacturer we were using didn't have their process very dialed. Um, we we're using a low cost manufacturer over in China for this. And then as um, we kind of started producing more and more units, we were able to get it up and over like the 99% threshold eventually. And so ideally you're looking for like less than 1% fallout at this stage. All right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that like depends on the complexity of the board. Like if you have a processor with a ton of BGA pads on it, like you're going to have, that's harder to assemble and you'll have more fallout. Um, so to actually implement these uh, test fixtures, um, it takes a wide array of engineering skills. Um, to design the mechanical bed of nails fixture, you need to, um, do a decent amount of mechanical engineering so that you know that all of your test probes are in the right spot, um, that you're pushing down on the PCB and aren't going to bend it. 
um, you need to apply some electrical engineering uh, with connecting between the test points on in the fixture and the instrumentation that will actually be making those measurements. You need to know what instrumentation you need to uh, choose for what measurements you're taking. And then there's some software engineering involved where you want to write a automated test script that will um, run this test so that you don't need the uh, test operator to actually do anything. So the standardized uh, kind of functional test fixture approach is you'll have a bed of nails fixture um, that's manually wired. Um, typically, like you'll wire out from the uh, test probe to either an interface plate or um, the actual instrumentation that you're using. Um, then the most common thing is to have like a rack of uh, PXI test equipment. Um, so these, this is like fairly expensive test equipment that you can purchase from like National Instruments or Keysight or various other vendors. And then um, most um, people use a combination of LabVIEW and test stand to develop the actual uh, test um, scripts and uh, run them in the factory. How long does all that usually take to get set up? Um, it can, it takes a pretty long time. So the fastest I've ever seen a fixture get turned around was about like four weeks, um, but it was pretty simple. And I've also seen them take up to like six to seven months to deliver a complete one. Wow. And it certainly looks expensive. Yeah, definitely expensive. Um, most of the commercial vendors that I was getting quotes at, um, it would put functional tests as some costs around like $100,000 or so to contract all of it out. Wow. Yeah, expensive. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and a lot of my time was at a, um, like a consumer electronic company where we were building a uh, low cost, like IOT devices, and we weren't able to spend $100,000 on a fixture and justify it. And so that was kind of what helped um, start me down this road to what we call now the fixture fab approach, where we're still using bed of nails testers, but we've kind of changed the other components to help decrease the cost of the system. Well, I mean, so, if if you don't mind me saying where you got yourself into trouble was when you tried to justify spending a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Very true. If I had just spent it probably would have been fine. <laughs> um, so at Fixture Bab, like a, we use Ingen test fixture bases. So it's a very simple, like a bed of nails, a fixture system. However, um, Ingen provides like very robust and fairly low cost uh, test fixtures. And we're able to uh, integrate the entire test system within the fixture base. So we'll actually put a computer in there as well as all the instrumentation that's needed to um, take the measurements. And we do this by designing a custom circuit board for each test fixture that solders to the uh, test probes, as well as using um, some instrumentation from a company called Acronym, which actually slides directly into that circuit board. So that eliminates the need for having a complete uh, external uh, rack with a bunch of instrumentation in it. And then instead of paying uh, thousands of dollars for licenses to test stand in LabVIEW, um, and the fact that uh, neither Joe or I prefer to use graphical programming, uh, we've implemented a like test framework based in Python that heavily leverages a bunch of open source libraries that are well documented. And so by moving here, we've been able to like eliminate costs and streamline our fixture designs. So um, how do you actually interface between a circuit board and a test fixture? And what does the fixture actually do? So the first part is like a, you make a measurement on a test, like on a, the device you're testing using a test point. And you interface to that test point using a pogo pen, which is a spring-loaded pen. Um, this is the bottom of the Artemis board. And you can see there's like various test points on it. Um, so they would probably use these for programming the board um, during manufacturing using a bed of nails fixture, like a simple one. Um, so the actual test fixture also consists of uh, two different parts. So there's the test fixture base, and this can be reused from device to device. And this is where we build in the computer. Um, and this acts as like a panini press to um, press the circuit board against the uh, test probes. And then there's the interface cartridge, which is the um, part that's actually customized for the circuit board that you're testing. Um, the cartridge consists of three different plates, and those are the plates that you actually need to customize for each different circuit board. Um, the pressure plate will have pins in it that will push down against the circuit board that you're testing. 
the moving plate will support it from the bottom to prevent you from uh, bending the uh, like a device under test. And then the pro plate is what will actually have all of the um, pogo pens and receptacles mounted to it. So within our test fixture bases, um, we integrate a computer, usually an Intel Nuke, as well as a USB hub, and then any power supplies that are needed by the fixture. Um, and then for the interface cartridge, this is the part that actually gets customized. So we have the uh, kind of green pro plate. So that will have all of the holes machined into it for the various uh, test probes. There's the test point carrier board underneath it. So that is a um, custom circuit board that will then interface all of these test probes to whatever instrumentation um, we're using. In this case, it's an acronym USB stem that we're using to control the entire fixture. And then on the top, there's the moving plate that's supporting the uh, device that's being tested. There's, um, if we can go back for a second, there's a lot of test probes there. How much force, I mean, each one of those is a little spring. When you add all that up, is, is, does it become a problem or? Yeah, it, it can become a problem. So um, for, it depends on exactly which test probe you're using, but the ones we use for the most part uh, apply one Newton of force, like for each pen. And um, like this fixture, for example, has I think like 200 to 250 pins on it. So like that's a lot of force when you add it up. And um, specifically like when you have a connector with a bunch of pins where you're probing off like every pin on that connector, like if you like uh, I have, have a bunch of force just in that one corner of the circuit board and you aren't pushing down on it, it'll cause the circuit board to actually bend when it's put into mm. the fixture. And that can cause a lot of issues with like actually causing failures on the circuit board that you're testing as you're testing it. So that's where the, um, you need to actually do some mechanical analysis to make sure that you aren't bending your circuit board due to the forces involved. And how do you do that? Like finite element analysis or? Yep, exactly. So um, you need to model what your test fixture is in CAD and then do some finite element analysis. And that's like one thing, like if it's a complicated fixture with a bunch of pens, like we will definitely do that. However, if it's really simple with not too many and it's low risk, then we'll usually skip that step. Okay. Um, here's kind of a closer look at that same uh, interface cartridge just within the fixture. So um, the first picture is the you know, complete fixture without a um, device under test in it. The middle picture is the moving plate. Um, from here, you can see that the test probes are actually recessed a little bit from the plate. This is because you don't want the um, device you're testing to actually interface with any of the pogo pins or instrumentation before um, you have it closed in the fixture. And then on the right side, that's what the fixture looks like. Um, or you can just see all of the pogo pins kind of poking up through their holes. And so you can see there's a lot of them. Um, on this uh, test fixture, we're testing a kind of development board that had a socket for um, a device that had three like 50 pin um, 1.27 millimeter spacing connectors. So it was a lot of pins in a very small area. <laughs> Lots of force. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's a look at the uh, test point carrier board for that circuit board. Um, you know, your obligatory botch wire from uh, not doing a design review. Um, and then this uh, test fixture was just doing continuity checks for the most part. And so um, we have a bunch of kind of multiplexers and then the acronym module would actually control those and then take the measurements between two points. So this is just a custom circuit board and it's much cleaner than having to manually wire to each one of those um, test probes and then run that to separate instrumentation. So instead of running, you know, 250 wires, we just have one circuit board and it connects over USB and a power connector. That still seems like a whole lot of pins in a very tiny oh, yeah. area. Is, is that best practice or is that just kind of what happened? Uh, this is not best practice. Um, it's just what happened on this board. So uh, we had to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. And this is like a, also why um, kind of design for tests is really important as you're designing your circuit boards. Um, if you go into the layout process, like knowing that you're going to use a bed of nails fixture, you can kind of follow a couple best practices to make it much easier to build a robust test fixture. 
Um, for example, like using a test probe that's 75 mil or like 1.9 millimeter spacing is much more reliable than using a 50 mil or 1.27 millimeter uh, spacing probe. And that's just because the probes are larger and uh, more robust and they don't fail as often. And so by keeping those uh, ideas in mind as you're designing, you can make this test fixture process much better and you'll end up with a more reliable fixture at the end. Um, the last part that you need to um, customize of the test fixture is the uh, pressure plate. And so this is the plate that actually uh, pushes against the circuit board that you're testing and it will push it against the uh, test probes um, that are mounted into the uh, probe plate. So um, just as an overview for like uh, the systems that we actually deliver, uh, we use Ingen test fixture bases. Um, they're great. If you're looking at building your own test fixture, like I would highly recommend checking them out. Um, can't recommend them high enough. Um, and then we use Acronym MTM instrumentation as much as we can. So uh, this allows us to integrate everything within the cartridge, as, you, as I mentioned, and it makes for a very clean uh, test fixture. And then where FixtureFab uh, specializes is we will implement the automated test scripts, as well as do the actual customization of the cartridges for um, whatever uh, circuit board that you're um, testing. And um, where uh, we are a little bit different from a typical uh, test fixture house is that we spend a lot of time actually automating the design process, um, the mechanical design process of these cartridges. So how this process works is uh, you'll take your ECAD file, um, which can be a test point list um, exported from Altium or Mentor Graphics, as well as uh, we also support native um, CAD files from KiCad and Eagle. And uh, once you upload this file, we'll identify where the test point locations as well as mounting holes and some other features. You can then configure the test fixture. So um, enable and disable whichever uh, test probes that you actually want to use, um, add guide pins and pressure pins. And then you can actually view a 3D render of the test fixture that allows you to move around um, the device you're testing so that it's located in the spot you want in the fixture. After you've done all of the uh, kind of configuration and um, figuring out where you want the dot located, you can then generate a design file package. And then uh, this you can either purchase from us to fabricate this picture yourself, or we can also um, sell you a complete uh, machined and assembled test picture. So uh, going back to the ECAD files, um, the EDA software files for a moment, is it only those particular software where programs, or if I have something else that can export to one of those, I can still use your service? Um, if it can export to one of those, um, you can still use our service. Uh, you would just want to like validate that the export um, was valid. And are those just the Gerbers, the 274Xs or? Yeah, exactly. Class? Okay. 274X. Right. Um, kind of our like a preferred method right now is to actually use a test point list. And we have a template that you can fill out. Um, and the biggest reason for this is to force you to actually go through the design process with your head of, or the uh, kind of like figuring out what you would like to test and what test points you actually need. Um, so we'll kind of walk through that process here uh, during the demo. Um, and then for uh, KiCad and Eagles like uh, files, the upload works great. Um, however, with the Gerbers, we don't get net information. Uh, from it. So you end up with a list of test points, but we don't know what net or designator there actually are. So you have to go through and manually look at their coordinates. So, um, you know, KiCad and Eagle are great if you design using those or can get your uh, design file into that format. But for the most part, we've been uh, recommending using the test point list. Um, so uh, one great part of automating the design of these fixtures is that um, we started applying it to development fixtures as well instead of just production fixtures. Um, so these are low cost fixtures that you can easily 3D print or laser cut and use them throughout the um, development process. Um, one of the companies I'd worked at previously, we were um, manually designing these like a uh, laser cut or a uh, CNC machine fixtures uh, that we would use to um, help develop our PCBA functional tests before we actually had real fixtures available for us. And it just allowed us to like test various um, circuit boards 
and uh, it was much easier to develop our test scripts. Um, and as we were doing that, the firmware engineers at the company started seeing these fixtures and wanted them as well. And what happened was like it helped them um, kind of program and develop on various different devices like so much faster that they were saving about five hours a week um, from just having one of these fixtures around. And so um, we started like uh, automating the design of these because you can actually get a laser cut fixture within a week and we're trying to uh, decrease that lead time even more. And it just helps your uh, development cycle as you're um, you know, either developing the hardware or creating the test script. So cool. we'll kind of walk through a uh, little demo uh, design right now using a um, circuit board that was made for the uh, Teach Me PCB uh, class. Yeah, for those of you uh, who don't know, and I, I don't see that George has joined us, um, Advanced Assembly, Royal Circuits, DigiKey, um, Altium, a lot of people have gotten together and we're hosting a free PCB uh, web design or PCB design course over at teachmepcb.com. The first cohort is finishing up now, um, but one of the participants, George Garcia, who works for Autodesk, made a board for us, and that's what we're looking at here. He's in a meeting right now, but hopefully he'll uh, join us here pretty soon, and we'll have him tell you a little bit more about his design. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is the board that uh, George designed. So it, we're going to uh, develop a very simple development fixture for it. Um, this will be used for programming the board. So uh, the test points we'll need for this fixture um, are located down here in the bottom right. Um, so these will be used to program one of the processors as well as a couple of test points up here in the top left or middle left, um, which will be used to program the other processor. Um, there are, there's also like a power test point and a ground test point down here. Um, so I've already gone through and done the work of um, creating a test point list. So this was done by going to the uh, ECAD file, like zooming in on whichever test point we needed and then just selecting it. Which, you know, maybe I'll figure out how to do. There we go. Um, and then from here, you can get the uh, coordinates of that test pad. Um, I am all about millimeters, so I do all of my measurements in millimeters. <laughs> yeah, but there we can see. So, you know, 59.309 and 38.481. So you can manually go through and identify exactly where each test point is and then add those locations to um, this uh, Google Sheet. And we have a template that um, you can fill out to use with our platform. Um, after that, you can download the uh, CSV of the uh, sheet, and then uh, we can move over to FixtureFab to actually do the design process. So from uh, FixtureFab.com, you'll need to create an account before you can upload a project. But um, to create a project, you just need to enter a project name. So we'll call this badge the Teach Me PCB Badge Programming Fixture. We'll leave the default PCB thickness, and then we will uh, select our uh, test point list that we created. So after this, um, you can create the project. This is, uh, we will then kind of upload all of, or identify all of the uh, test points on that circuit board. Um, you can select from a couple different test fixture types that we currently support. There's this toggle clamp fixture, which is 3D printable. Um, a couple in-gen cartridges that are supported for uh, production fixtures. And then uh, we'll use this Dev260 um, laser cut fixture for this one. So from here, you can now configure the various uh, test point settings. So for each test point, you'll need to select a receptacle and test probe type. Um, we currently only support ones that we have in stock. However, we're working on uh, increasing the numbers or the uh, part numbers that we uh, have supported. Um, and then you also want to add all of your uh, kind of guide pins and pressure pins. So for guide pins, there's a couple different ways to go about this. Um, the ideal way is to use a uh, what's called a spring pin and um, 
that will can be used with a mounting hole and it will help locate your uh, PCB wherever you want. And then it will also like uh, spring back and forth as the um, PCB is pressed into the fixture. Um, since this circuit board design doesn't have any uh, mounting holes on it, we'll actually use a couple of dowel pins. And the easiest way to find locations for um, like your guide pins is to look at your uh, electronic design file and then see like how can we actually locate it. So for this, I'm going to use four uh, three millimeter dowel pins and we'll locate them kind of by the rope bot's neck as well as down by its legs. And so this will like give us both like vertical positioning as well as um, horizontal. And then um, to add the actual pins, I found that I just add them to a layer with an eagle and then you can like kind of create a circle and then set its diameter. So since I'm using a three millimeter pen, we'll use a radius of 1.5 millimeters. And then you can then um, kind of move this around until you find the location that would work. How accurate do you have to be with that location? Um, so you want to be within about like, I'd say like 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 millimeters um, away from the board. Like okay. the cool thing with dowel pins is you can bend them a little bit, but you really want them to be straight. So um, you don't want it to be like exactly on the board edge, but you want to be about like a tenth of a millimeter away. And this also depends on uh, the diameter of the test points that you're using. The larger your diameter of the test point, the uh, larger tolerances you have in positioning. Um, so for uh, come on, properties. Oh. There we go. Control Z, Control Z. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so for this guide pin, it has a position of, you know, 23.9 by 31.3. So if we go back to Fixture Fab, we can do add a new guide pin. Give this a name, coordinate. And then um, the diameter you can leave um, blank and we'll want this in the probe plate and we'll choose a three millimeter uh, dowel pin. So from there, like uh, you can save it or add additional pins. Um, for pressure pins, you want to add those in a similar way. And with these, you can just uh, like um, kind of move the uh, pressure pins we have have a three millimeter tip. So you can just move this around or the circle around and find the locations across the circuit board where you actually want to push down on it. Um, we won't do that right now, but I have a completed project over here uh, where we oh, added. Cheater, cheater. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so here, this has all of the guide pins. So um, we have four dowel pins used to uh, locate the robot, as well as four spring pins, which um, actually have plastic tips on them and are used underneath this board to help even it out since uh, the pogo pins we're using are only down here and here. Um, if we were to only use the pogo pins to like help like provide leveling of this circuit board, it would tip um, since there's nothing up here to uh, apply pressure to the circuit board. Um, and then we added five pressure pins at various locations around the uh, circuit board to push down um, across the entire thing evenly. So after you add all of the features that you need for the circuit board, you can then view a 3D render. Um, from here, it will uh, default to like the orientation of the board um, in your CAD software, as well as uh, it will just center it within the test fixture. Um, from there, like depending on the size of the board, you might need to change the orientation. And then you can also change like the actual location of the uh, device. So here's a 3D render of what the test fixture will actually look like. Um, from here, we can actually see that we have the uh, six pins down here, uh, the six pogo pins that correspond to these six test points down here in the bottom of the board. And then there's the uh, four dowel pins that are used to um, locate the actual robot. And then these white pins are the pressure pins that will actually push down against the robot. Um, from this uh, view, it looks like we're about centered. So we can actually just say that we're done with designing this test fixture and hit the generate fixture design. 
Um, from here, this will actually create the uh, design package and you can then go on to um, purchase it from us as a download or purchase a complete fixture from us. And I can also just say, hey, uh, Duncan, I got a board, make me happy, right? Yep, just exactly. Yeah. Um, if you have a board and you just want a test picture, you can just send us an email as well and um, we can um, work out a quote and design a test picture for you. Um, let's see here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second because um, we actually have a demo fixture here. So this doesn't have the Teach Me PCB badge in it. Um, I wasn't able to get that built in time. That's but, um, okay. This is a development fixture for a small spark fun um, like USB-C power delivery board. So uh, with this, um, this board has four different holes that we're using to locate it. And then it has a bunch of different pogo pins um, that are used to configure and then test it. Let's see if you can get a better shot of that. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. So to put the board into the fixture, just put it in the right direction. And then you can kind of close the top notch it down. And then from here, we actually have some instrumentation and a breadboard. Um, and this is used to actually interface with the uh, pogo pins. Um, for these simple development fixtures, you can actually just use uh, like low cost like jumper wires and connect them, like slide them onto the end of the test probe. So it's a great way to like just prototype fixtures super quick. And then all this does is configure the board using I squared C. And then um, we validate the voltage output using a uh, analog to digital converter that's on this uh, USB host adapter. Hmm. That we're using. Yeah. So that's um, like uh, the big thing about these fixtures is like we can get these like shipped to you within about like four to five days. Um, which allows you to like have an actual fixture to develop with. Um, and we found them to be like very helpful, like either developing test scripts or developing firmware, because it allows you to just throw a new device in. And um, if you're developing like a small IoT product or something where the circuit boards are really tiny and you don't have space for a programmer connector or like a tag connect connector, then you can just have a couple of test points on it and you can use those for your actual firmware debugging and development versus having to like, you know, add a connector to your circuit board that takes up a lot of space. Very cool. Yeah. You've, you've uh, been very, very quiet over there, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I have been. All right, so we do have a couple questions and now's a great time to ask questions if you haven't, um, if you haven't asked them already. Uh, first one was, do you perform the stress analysis yourselves? So this is back to the mechanical, uh, the FEA, or do you have a provider? Um, we've typically been uh, doing it ourselves. However, we're looking at um, ways to make it faster to get results from that. Um, for us, like uh, we'll take our uh, kind of our design from Fixture Fab and then import it into either SolidWorks or Fusion 360 and then um, perform analysis within there. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question there, anonymous attendee. Uh, we do have a question. Do you accept ODB, OBD++ files? <laughs> Not yet. Um, it's on the list of like uh, supported files. Um, we're definitely moving towards using like uh, or supporting like OBD++ as well as uh, IPC 2581, I believe. Something like, I don't, there's a lot of IPC standards, man. I don't. <laughs> yeah, but um, like our goal is to kind of support the major um, CAD formats and ODB++ includes everything we need as well as the uh, IPC standard. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would add to that um, for, for this particular user, uh, Royal Circuits, you know, we get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of files a year. 98% of them are Gerber's. Um, one of the reasons that these other formats haven't caught on, you know, um, the IPC 70, is it 7581 or what, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, Gerber works. It, it's worked for decades and it provides plenty of information. So there's not a whole lot of motivation for people to move away from it. There's not a whole lot of motivation for cam houses to move away from it. Um, so even though they can support it, they just, they just don't. Um, ODB++ is a good is a good thing though. So uh, might be something to add to the roadmap there. 
All right, we've got somebody. Um, could you use a position report to get your test point locations automatically? They should show up as a component even though they are not populated. Yeah. So, yeah. A position report, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, um, so XYRS potentially could have that information. Um, it shouldn't even be that much work to write a quick Python script or just use a regular expression to you know, find the test point apertures and then pull them out of the Gerbers um, for this particular user. So yeah, if you have a bunch of points, um, if all of your test points are the same size, they're all gonna show up in your uh, Gerber file as the same aperture. And then you just need to go look at you know, when that aperture is referenced and you'll get your list of XYs. So yeah, you could do that. Um, sorry, I probably should have given that question to you guys. I, <laughs> yeah. um, I really like the idea of using a position report. Um, like uh, we're always looking for better ways uh, to implement this. So um, yeah, send us an email, we'll talk. <laughs> Uh, that is actually one of the members of the Teach Me PCB course who asked that one. Um, and he's the one that I put you guys in contact with. Oh, Jesse. Yep. yep. I need to get back to you. <laughs> yeah. He's a good guy. I really like, I really like him. Um, can you ballpark, uh, if you're comfortable doing this on the air, if not, that's okay too, but can you kind of ballpark prices? Yeah. Um, so the design package for the laser cut fixture is a hundred dollars. And then for a machine fixture, they start at $300. So it's like a $300 base price. And then depending on the number of, um, test probes and guide pins and stuff like that, the price will increase. So in terms of electrical engineering, uh, cost structures, it's free. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. Um, Question is, the pogo pins, do they generate interference when testing and validating high-speed signals? So yes, they do. Um, they do add some parasitics to whatever signals you're measuring. Um, however, it depends like how high-speed you're actually looking at. Um, if you're looking at you know, measuring really high-speed connectors, then you can use different types of test points and probes that um, enable you to actually you know, make those measurements. But um, we've had luck using uh, just pogo pins for anything up to even like USB-C and MIPI um, signals. However, if you're trying to do like in signal integrity testing or anything like that, you'll definitely want to look for a different method. Yeah, you'd want a coax or something along those. But most of us aren't doing that type of thing, um, you know? So it's probably not a problem. Um, Comment says, according to our PCB suppliers, OBD++ is preferred to Gerber's as it conveys more information than it and intent, not data. All of our CMs require it for denied review. Yes, okay, so I should clarify. Royal Circuits, we like o, um, the uh, ODB++ as well, um, definitely do. Uh, what I'm saying is that's not what we're getting from our customers. It's not that we're requiring Gerber's from our customers, it's that's what they're supplying to us. Um, so my comment isn't that Gerber's are better than uh, ODB++, and if I said that I was completely mistaken, what I'm saying is we're getting Gerber's, okay? Um, but ODB++ would be uh, preferred over just the raw Gerber's, um, so. Um, for boards without test points, is it recommended to probe the pins on the bottom of the through hole connectors on the board for a bed of nails fixture? Um, I would say yes. So like um, if you don't have test points, but you have through hole connectors, then you can actually use like a cup style probe and it interfaces with the bottom of connectors like great. It's a great method for um, probing uh, those connectors. Um, you can also get like side actuation uh, mechanisms, which will actually plug into the connector, depending on the connector type. And um, those can work well as well. Um, however, they definitely add costs and complexity to the fixture. So uh, most of the time, if it's like a large um, spacing on that connector, you know, like 100 mils or even 50 mils, then I would go uh, to probe it on the bottom. Okay. Um Is there, this is one in chat, but I'm gonna pull it in anyway. Is there any solution for pads on the edge? I'm guessing they're thinking things like castellated vias, uh, oh, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing is my best guess. 
Yeah. Um, so with like castellated vias or something like that, um, you can probe on it. We've had some issues, like uh, the biggest issue is with like alignment because as you have like the test probes come up and if you only have like a like, you know, half hemisphere to probe, like sometimes the board will just get pushed away. So if you have mounting holes or something that can like, you know, definitely locate it in the right spot, you can get a probe tip that will actually work well on those. Um, our favorite, like if there are castellated vias, our favorite method of doing that is to go to the method where you have like the castellation as well as the through hole, like right next to it in the pad. And then we just probe onto the through hole part. Yeah, it might also be possible to create a, a small toggle or a small cam that pushes the probes in from the side, but man, you just, I don't know, you're asking for trouble. Yeah, the side one, I've built a couple like that and like, yes, they do work, but it's, it, I don't know. They aren't very reliable. Like yeah. uh, you end up with false failures. Yeah, and that's no good. Okay, um, you may or may not be able to answer this one. Have you looked at integrating your fixture generation tool with the production line tool test platform from Blue Clover Devices? Are you familiar um, with Blue Clover? Re we recently became aware of Blue Clover and it, they have a really cool um, implementation for ICT. Um, we haven't talked with them yet, but it's definitely something that we'd be interested in integrating um, our fixture with. All right. Do we have any other questions out there for... Uh, Duncan, or you know, maybe something for Joe. Joe's been kind of left out of all of this. It's, it's easier with just one main point for the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with that, gentlemen, that certainly looks exciting. Um, very cool stuff, and and you know, it seems affordable and, and a whole lot of fun. Um, how do you keep abreast? of all of the changes in the, the test fixture industry? Or, you know, if, if it's something that I wanna learn more about, do you have any resources I can read or any suggestions? Yeah, so um, we have a vlog where we've been um, adding a lot of articles uh, reg in regards to like how to design test fixtures and kind of like our methodology for it, um, which you can find at fixturefab.com slash TFG. Um, we're calling it the test fixture guide. So we're building it out and uh, our goal is to like keep adding more resources to kind of help people learn how to do functional testing. Um, from uh, my experience, like there is some resources out there, but there's nothing that really goes into the technical um, details on actually implementing tests. Um, another interesting uh, spot to look for resources is from SparkFun actually. Um, within their blog, there's a couple of articles that they've released on um, how they do production testing. Um, the latest one, I think, was on their test device called like the Flying Jalapeno or something similar to that, where they actually go into like how to test for short circuits and um, a couple other uh, methods that they use. That's pretty interesting. And then um, there's also information from a couple um, of the larger test houses like Circuit Check as well. All right, we did get a late question here. Um, how do you deal with bent pogo pins? Uh, are pins soldered in place or do you use the uh, barrel holders for the pins? So um, we use the barrel holders or uh, receptacles for all of our pins. Um, I didn't initially when I first started building these fixtures and then you know you break a pin and it turns into a whole ordeal uh, desoldering the pin and getting a new one back in. So I would recommend like the uh, receptacles add a little bit of cost to a test fixture, but they're so worth it if you're designing your own, like definitely use test pro receptacles. Yeah, and the uh, the Poco pins don't last forever, do they? No, they don't. Um, most, like uh, again, it depends on exactly what Pogo pin you're using, but um, they rate their lives in, you know, hundreds of thousands of cycles. And realistically, I see anywhere from 10,000 to a hundred thousand uh, units depending on the uh, fixture. All right. Well, with that, I've, it, it's certainly been educational and I, I wanna thank you both for your time. Um, your website is fixturefab, F-I-X-T-U-R-F-A-B dot com. Note, there's no E. Um, just visit it, check it out, play around with the software, see what happens. Maybe you'll, you'll find that you can integrate it into your next design. Your time's valuable, right? So if, you know, I, I don't know what you make in your engineering jobs these days, $60, an hour, more or less, depending on what you're doing. Um, but you figure if you're, you've got, you know, 30 boards and, and you're spending, you know, 
40, 30 hours of your time programming them, you're wasting money by not getting a test fixture from somebody or making your own or, or something along those lines. So look at the, you know, the, the cost benefit analysis and see if it makes sense for you. If you have any questions, you can reach me at mhughes at aapcb.com. Duncan, Joe, any last thoughts? No, thank you for having us. We enjoyed this. It's great. Oh, it was my pleasure. All right, everyone, have a great rest of the day, and uh, we'll let you know when we're doing our next webinar. We're not doing them every week anymore, so uh, have a great rest of the week and a wonderful weekend. Be safe. Bye, everyone.